The Big 12 bros are back. Robbie Triano is joining today's Big 12 Watch. I am your host, Josh Neighbors. Is the Big 12 overrated is the big question we're asking today about Big 12 basketball. This is the Big 12 Watch once again here on Crystal Ball College Football, part of the 365 Sports Network. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and on YouTube as well. Uh, find us on X slash Twitter at NWPod365. You guys can find me at Josh Neighbors underscore. You all can find the show wherever you get your podcast. Five stars in those places, please. And also like the video, subscribe to the channel, and leave your comments as well. All of those things help support our fine program. Robbie, I described it as a bloodbath in rounds one and two for the Big 12 because round one wasn't really a massive bloodbath. Um, five and three in round one, but the Big 12 was two and three in round number two. Two teams make it through to the Sweet 16. Iowa State without too much of a complication. That uh, that Washington State game was somewhat close, but really not in the end very close, it felt like. And then uh, Houston, they're kind of patched it together. They're beat up, they're banged up, but they find a way to get through, which is not a good sign for their long-term prospects, but that's what great teams do. They find a way through, and so they get through. But really, this this show is not about the ones that made it. It's about the ones that we lost along the way. This is the in memoriam section of the Oscars uh, right here. And so I guess the big question is you see what the ACC did. You know, you look at how strong um, uh, UConn looks, I guess. The ACC is really the conference that 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 did a great job in, in the first round. They're kind of the big winners out of all of this. So um, is, the, is the Big 12 the best basketball conference in the country? We'll start there. Yeah, this, um, this was a surprising run for the Big 12 in the tournament, but also a very not surprising run because we love the depth of this conference very much. We think head to toe, very good. That did not play out well, this tournament. And the reason why I think you look at the teams that did lose, like we kind of saw that when you and I were talking about these teams, like we talk about a BYU, man, they can really shoot, but if they miss some, they're going to lose. And that's what happened. And I think the the kickstart of the tournament of like, oh, upsets are here. BYU should have definitely won that game. I don't know what happened there. And then you look at a team like Baylor. Baylor is a team that like, man, if they get hot, they can beat anybody. But if they can't shoot or if they can't get stops, they're screwed. That's what happened to Baylor. And I think that this kind of proved that the league, you know, I don't, this is where I'm so confused because I want to have this point of like, man, the league isn't as good as we thought, but we still have a chance to win a national title. Like we still have Houston in a chance to win. We still have Iowa State in a chance to win that title. But I do think when it comes to the optics, if you have Fran Fraschilla, if you have on every college basketball broadcast, every college basketball podcast, everywhere in Sports Center, they say, man, the Big 12 is the deepest and best conference in college basketball. And at the Sweet 16, you only have two teams left. And if you look at the Power Five, the ACC has four teams. The Big Ten has two. Okay, we're tied with the Big Ten. That's fine. The SEC has three. The Big East has three. The Pac-12 has one. So, like, the Big 12 should be up there. Like, Baylor is a team that should be still in the Sweet 16. Kansas, Kansas had a lot of injuries. I'm not, like, that one, they got blown out. I'm not going to defend them. But, like, at least Baylor should be in this mix as well. So I think a very disappointing run for them. So this is where I'm not going to say the Big 12 is screwed. But if I'm Brett Yormark and my selling point is the Big 12 is the best, like, that kind of took a little bit of a hit. Yeah, I would say the team I was most disappointed in was Baylor. Um, especially because they looked so strong in round one, and we expected them to. But round two came along, and they never led. They ne at no point led Clemson. Now, I made the comp yesterday. That game kind of felt like the Houston game because despite the fact that they never led, they had the ball late in the game with a chance to tie and take the lead. And I was thinking, you know, does, does Baylor really need to change the way they play? I, I, I love the guard-oriented style. It is an aesthetically pleasing style of basketball, so I don't think they need to change the way they're playing. Um, I just, I think that Clemson played really well and I think Baylor missed a lot of shots and 
you know, that it's the part about like the big 12 seasons, like you can win nine games and there's an, uh, lose nine games rather. there's the next day, there's the next game, but then you go to the tournament and it's one and done. And so it's like, you basically need to have a super team. I mean, you, you need to have what Baylor had back in 2021. You need to have what Kansas had back in 2022. You need to have what UConn looks like now and last year in 2023. And if we're poking a lot of holes, it's a problem, right? If we're saying things like if you have an off shooting night, like how do you counteract an off shooting night if you are Houston? Houston can do it with defense, right? They can do it with he- defense and rebounding. Actually, they kind of got smoked in the rebounding department against AM, but like they they took that disadvantage. They still were able to do it actually with excellent defense. I mean, Wade Taylor had a terrible, terrible game for the field. And I think ultimately that's what won them the game. Baylor could not do that. So you need to have the variety of things to rely on. And that's what tripped up BYU. That's what tripped up TCU. That's what tripped up Texas Tech is that these teams couldn't, just in my opinion, they could not overcome bad shooting nights. Yeah, definitely. And to to talk about Baylor for a second, I don't know if this is the reason they lost, but I want to give, this is a lot of credit, but also a lot of, you need to find more consistency if you're Scott Drew. Like Scott Drew has had an incredible four years. He won a national title game, the best team that we've seen, honestly, in college basketball in a really long time. But a lot of players on that team were in that program for a long time. In the last couple of years, we've seen the Baylor program kind of change a little bit to be a mix of one and dones, but also a great use of the transfer portal. And we've seen that with Jeremy Sohan. We have Kendall Brown. You have Keontae George. You're gonna have you're gonna have players this year who are going to the NBA and going to be one and like one and dones. And like he's done a really good job of still being very good in college basketball, but also having this roster turnover. But now we're seeing the last couple of years with this roster turning over. He's having a lot of good regular season success, but he's not getting over the hump to get in the Sweet 16 or make a deep run because we look at the starting five, the only returning starter from last year is Jalen Bridges, and he was a transfer from the year before. So this is where if I'm Baylor like, and I'm Scott Drew, I'm not saying let's get rid of the one and dones because I think he's found a way to make those players so good. But you look at like how can we make deep runs but also like have this consistency. And that's where if I'm Scott Drew, I don't know what to do because, you know, we see the teams that are currently like in the, in the sweet 16 and they've been together for a really long time. We look at Iowa state. That's a group that's been together. We look at Purdue, Zach eady has been there forever. Like a lot of these teams that are still in the tournament, like have had that cohesion and consistency playing together. And if I'm Scott Drew, it's like, how can I do that? So I'm not saying the Baylor program is screwed because I really do think, Scott Drew has done an incredible job using, you know, NBA draft players in the portal. But that's where, like, how can you get over that bump now that they they you can't really do now in like in, in college basketball? Yeah, I was thinking about the, the team construction because you know I, I want to know what you thought about Bill Self's comments. You know about him saying, "I've been focusing on the future," and you know, I, it sounds bad. I, I think he could have. I knew what he was worded. saying. I, but you know exactly what he's saying. How is he not like when he's shorthanded? And look, I'll tell you what, Gonzaga has been playing some excellent, excellent basketball as of late. Like they really have been. So I don't want to knock them at all. I mean, they're, uh, you know, they were, they were kind of nearly a bubble team. And then ever since that, they, uh, they lost to, let's see, they lost to St. Mary's uh, on the 12th, but sandwiched in there. They lost, they lost St. Mary's twice. They had, let's see, one, two, three, four, five. They won like eight or nine straight games. And then obviously they had that big win over McNeese and the win over Kansas. They've been playing really good basketball. And so they lost to a better team that was a deeper team that had more options. And Bill Self, I think, knows about his team's shortcomings and the lack of meaningful depth that they've had. And so he's had to be on the hunt for like what kind of guys are there. I mean, you know, I talk about guys. I thought a disappointing player KU had last couple of years was the Joseph Yesfu, but they didn't even have that off the bench, right? They didn't even have a guy like that off the bench that they could go to or rely on in any way, shape, or form. And so you hear Bill Self say something like, I'm thinking about the I'm thinking about next year's team. He needs to be because I think he knew this team could not win a championship. And uh, you know, they gave a great effort. As banged up as they were, they gave a great effort. But they were not they were not going to win the tournament this year. They couldn't even make it out of the, the the first weekend. 
you understand why, because it does take a mix of players that you developed, plus portal guys, plus good, individ good individual players. Like it takes a little bit of all of that. And so you have to, you, you do kind of understand what he was saying. Yeah. And to the people at home who like heard that and were like, wow, he was in this tournament and didn't even care about it. He was just looking like, that's obviously not what he was doing. What he was saying is like, wow, I need to make a roster that's not just three or four dudes and the rest are people that I can't really trust in any clutch moments or any time, any, any moment, really, I have to play my starting five. And if they get hurt, we saw what just happened to Kansas. Like they got screwed. And you think about the roster turnover that Kansas has had the last couple of years. They've had players leave for the NBA draft. And I think Grady Dick left, but I don't even know if he should have left. Like he's playing for the Raptors and getting good minutes, but that's because the Raptors are, if you're not watching a really bad basketball team, he should have stayed back another year. But besides like the Ochai's and the Jalen Wilson, he would have been like number one pick this year if he'd stayed. Yeah. Like, no, like, no kidding. That's how bad this draft is. And he would have been an absolute star in the March Madness. But you think about the players that left for the NBA. But you also have MJ Rice, who was a five star talent for Kansas, who left after one year because he wasn't getting playing time. Okay. You have Ernest Uday Jr., who left Kansas. Okay. Like, what? Okay. And then you have other players like Zach Clemens, who wasn't very good, but now he's leaving in the portal. So they had so many depth pieces that they had last year that they could rely on that are now gone and they had to go in the portal. And I think they really put all their NIL money in one basket and Hunter Dickinson. And like, I think that's a good bet to have because I think Hunter Dickinson is a good basketball player, college basketball player. And I think he is a player that in a league that is dominated by guards in the big 12, like he should have been able to feast in this league. He, he did lead the league in points, but he wasn't the league's, best player. And I look at Kansas and like, I get what Bill Self is saying. He's like, we need to build more of a roster. We need to build like a team that can go nine deep instead of the seven deep that I had to rely on all year. I'm with you on that. I want to, I want to focus on some of the other teams too. TCU is in a really interesting spot. This, this, this to me is the kind of one of the most interesting teams in the entire league. And, and they're actually a really good example of, of kind of modern college sports because think about transfers and what they do for a program, they elevate them obviously. And so I think with transfers now, people are like, we should be better faster, right? Because of transfers and whatnot. TCU is in the midst, they're in the midst right now, Robbie, of a, of the historic run in their basketball program's history. They have never, ever, made three consecutive NCAA tournaments. Crazy. They have never done that. Jamie Dixon has taken them to three straight NCAA tournaments. Here is the problem. Round of 32, round of 32, ra uh, first round. Last year in the Big Ten, they were, or excuse me, actually Big Ten, Big 12, and this is funny. Robbie, in 21-22, they were 8-10 in the Big 12. That was good enough for fifth place in the league just to show you how good the league was uh eight and eight and ten nine and nine nine and nine 21 and 13 22 and 13 21 and 13 right and so you're like this is really good for the program but at the same time if you're a tcu fan you took a step back in terms of where you were so th this is where it gets interesting right if you're a program like a tcu how do you balance where you've been what you accomplished Put the big picture of it. But because, like, I think TCU fans should be upset. I thought this team was deep enough. They were certainly old enough, right? They were certainly old enough when I think about Jameer Nelson Jr. and I think about uh, Miller and I think about Xavier Cork and I think about Micah Peavy, who, Micah Peavy, Robbie, I just saw something a second ago. Micah Peavy's entering the transfer portal. Micah Peavy? Has eligibility left? What? I mean, I remember Micah Peavy when he was at uh when he was at Texas Tech, right? It's like all these guys. I think he's yeah he's a, technically a senior, right? And he played at Texas Tech in 2021. Wow. Three years at TCU, and now you know he had a great year, averaged 11 points per game, didn't shoot the ball very very well from three. But you see what I'm saying here, and so like they had all these old guys, and they did not cash in, and and they got beat up pretty good in that first round game as well. Where does a program like a TCU go when you think about them in the great landscape? Because the thing is, like, are they going to fall in the pack now that a Cincinnati has gotten acclimated, now that a BYU 
has gotten acclimated now that a West Virginia gets the coach they want in DeVries from Iowa State and gets a player of the year. And I think I believe uh, Tucker DeVries is the player of the year, the, the, the son, right? Like, where is this heading for a program like a TCU? Yeah, this is, um, I made this point. I, I don't know if I tweeted it, but I made it, I made it in my head. TCU to me is the definition of average in the Big 12. They make the tournament. They do good things. This is a team, and I think that they they were constructed the way college basketball teams should be constructed in the modern era. They're a team that is old. There is a team that relied on the transfer portal. And this is a team that has had some form of cohesion. Like, yes, they've had most of these players transfer, but a lot of them have been playing together for many years. Like Emmanuel Miller, you have Micah Peavy, you have Xavier Cork. Like, this is a team that has players that have had consistency. But what they lack is a true star. And you had that in Mike Miles Jr., but he wasn't necessarily a shooter or a player that could dominate or could make an NBA roster, really, and, like, do damage. I understand Mike Miles is in the NBA, but if you ever see starting point guard Mike Miles, that's an issue. That's an issue for your NBA basketball team. So to me, I think TCU does fall in the pack because we see, like, we look at right now, Arizona is going to be dominating. If it, And this is where Colorado, which was a yeah, team man, that, that's That's one hell of a program, right? And, and my God, their game their has been so much fun to watch. Yeah, and Tad Boyle. I mean, like, he was – and it's funny because Eddie Lampkin, former TCU center – Played at Colorado. That was a great game, by the way. One of my favorites of the tournament. Um, but Both their TCU, games. Their game against Florida was fantastic, and their game against Marquette was fantastic. Right. And TCU, to me, I just feel like falls in the pack. Like, they're to me, TCU will forever just be an eight or nine seed in the tournament. Like, oh, they made it in. I don't have any expectations for you whatsoever. Um, And Jamie Dixon, like, I think you re – I don't know if they reached their ceiling of what they can be. Because I think in the NIL world, I think there is a lot of support for TCU and they have the money and they have the ability to get that. But I don't necessarily know what the ceiling is because I don't know, and I may be just ignorant here, I don't know how that fan base feels about like basketball when it Not comes basketball. to their hierarchy yeah. of like what what you care about. And like I, I don't know if a player is gonna go there just be like, and so that's where, like, I don't know if it's a destination spot for any recruit or any top transfer. So to me, I think TCU is just like literally the definition of average in Big 12 basketball. And it makes you think about, hey, what Baylor accomplished? Why can't TCU do that? Texas Tech, what well, they've accomplished, that, that's the next team I want to talk about. So Grant McCaslin, year one, definitely better than what we had under Mark Adams, if you're a, T, if a Texas Tech fan. But you think about, look, I, I think they've got the right guy. I, I thought... I thought this year they had the right guy. To me, the exciting and the terrifying part is they will go as far as Pop Isaacs will take them. Because when I watch him move and I watch him play, he moves like an NBA player, right? He has, he has the physical traits, the quickness of an NBA player. It would not shock me at all if next year Pop Isaacs comes back and he is, he is every he is everything you kind of you, you kind of see. You know, he's everything you want him to be, but he's not there yet. And so, what if I'm Texas Tech? I'm thinking, what do I need to put around to pop Isaacs? I, I think they have a chance. I think he's got a chance to be one of those remarkable college guards. But he cannot shoot, and he is way too careless with a basketball. But you just see him, and he's like, he's just a lunatic out. He is an absolute madman out there. It's fun to watch. I think they've got a star player. I know they tried to put Toussaint and Kerwin Walton, Darion Williams all around him and stabilize, and it did work. There were periods of times where that really worked, but you're worried about, you know, Texas Tech, uh, NC State was a team, and they looked like the better team, and at times they made Tech look like a collection of individuals. And so I think that's the big key for McCaslin. I'm actually excited to see what he does here because the thing about this year looked like good year one, but the expectation at Texas Tech for basketball, especially because of what fan investment is there, it's it's been risen. It is it is it is now it's been now ratcheted up a bit about what the expectation is for Texas Tech. First round exit. That's not what they're looking for in Lubbock when it comes to hoops anymore. 
Yeah, and obviously they faced a team that is much better than we thought they're going to be because NC State is still hanging around and like what an amazing end to the year for NC State. But to me, like I didn't have high expectations for Texas Tech basketball this year. Like they had a lot of roster turnover. You have Mark Adams leave. You have a new head coach come in and in a league that I think, you know, is so dominant. And for Pop Isaacs to be the star that we saw last year and then get even better this year and to have – you know, other stars emerge like, but you're, you're exactly right. When you say they're just like a collection of individuals who are kind of shoved together and had to make something work. But to me, like I have high hopes for Texas tech basketball for the future. And like before Chris Beard took over, what was that program? I don't think it was anything that we could be talking about. And then they went to a national title game and now they're at this place where the fan investment is incredible. And now this is a program that has on their third head coach in like four years and there's still like a a team in the Big 12 that you can count on to be at the top level or even be fighting to be in that top five, top three conversation. So for me, I think I think like buy stock in Texas Tech moving forward when their basketball program and Pop Isaacs is only a sophomore. If he tests the NBA waters and leaves, that would surprise me a whole lot because he is still a very small young guard who I don't think has the offensive explosive abilities yet to be like drafted in the first round. And if you can make some NIL money, improve your stock more and then go to the NBA your junior year and like be that's where I think Pop Isaacs needs to focus his game. Come back for another year, make that good NIL mon- money, be a star at Texas Tech and like have a program literally built around you. So I agree with you. Yeah, and one thing about him this year if you look at the numbers wise and this this is part of it the volume for him in terms of shots went up. And I don't think he was necessarily ready to be that offensive, carrying the offensive load. And also, I, I you know, he's, he's a good passer, but maybe a bit more DeWan Harris in his game could could go a long way for him. Uh, just a bit more of that. Also, Your that BYU last game Cougars. too, they, they only played seven guys. If you're Grant McCaslin, yeah. get get more guys, I would say. Yes. Yeah, because you're, yeah, you're, 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 yeah. I mean, and here here's his last two games. Houston. On 315, two for 13 shooting. NC State on 321, three of 16. He ended the year five for 29 from the floor, two of 16 from deep. Uh, lock yourself in the gym, brother. And I'm not saying he's not working hard enough as it is, but it's pretty clear just like he needs to just be just be a better shooter. I have another point too, and this is this would go for a lot of teams. And we talk about roster construction like we did earlier. And like we're saying to these teams, yeah, get this person in the portal. Get okay, well, everybody's getting somebody in the portal. And we could say, all right, we'll get a good recruit out of high school. Well, college basketball has never been older, and these five-star players are playing the least that they've played. You look at a team like Kentucky, man, yeah. so much NBA talent. Like, that's a team that, like, I think is more talented than basically any other team in the country. They're the most, they, they are the most talented, especially at guard. There's no team that's more talented than guard. But they are them. so young, and everybody else in college basketball is a grown man. And that's where, like, I feel for these college basketball head coaches. Like, like I – I don't feel for them because they're making millions of dollars, but I feel for them because they're like, all right, I need to bring in a five-star stud and they come in and they're not ready. And then they get frustrated because they aren't playing and then they leave. And then you're like, okay, well, I invested so much time in this guy, but now you have to resort to the transfer portal, which is like, okay, everybody's in the transfer portal. But also if you get a guy, now you have to acclimate him into your system. And then like, you're just having this hodgepodge team of like maybe misfit players, but you needed a body or someone good in the portal. And it feels like, that's where, to me, I think the quality of college basketball went down this year because I think it takes so long for your team to acclimate and for, like, you're mixing players that you not are necessarily – you are chosen to pick. And that's where I think now, like, we're seeing good basketball because we're reaching that apex level. But also the teams that are having success are the ones that have had the players stick there the longest but also result to the transfer portal when they need to. And I think teams like Texas Tech – and tech, TCU are resorting to the transfer portal because they have to do that. And that's where I feel bad for these coaches. Yeah. And also, you know, it brings up a great point when talking about pop, like the best thing for pop Isaacs would be, Hey, like year three, staying the course, stick with the process. Okay. You were good. You flashed the freshman. You're, you still look good as a sophomore, but your shot load increased. Your numbers went down. So the third year, if the, if the shot numbers stay the same, your numbers go back up because you're used to it. And like, hopefully that the guys that stay around you and the guys that bring in around you go up as well. The guy, the, the, the teams that we're looking at right now, um, Arizona, right? Caleb love is the big addition to that team. But like, I think about that team, 
you know, uh, Pella Larson, Umar Balo, like those guys have all, those two players have been on the team for a while. And you bring in a guy like Caleb Love who's been around for a long time too. Clemson, same deal. When you get a guy like a PJ Hall, he's been around San Diego state, Yukon, Bama, Carolina, Illinois, Iowa state. Like these are all, I was maybe, maybe some lesser extent, but still like, these are all teams that have got guys that have been around. These are not completely reshaped rosters that we're talking about still left here in the tournament. You know, even go the next day, Marquette, all those guys have been around. NC State's got a group of guys. Purdue, obviously, a group of guys that have been around. Duke has got multiple players that have been around. We know Houston has the exact same thing. Tennessee, you know, you toss in Dalton Connect to a group of guys that have already been around. You're seeing now that the the having the the I know Creighton having the collection of guys is helpful. BYU, Robbie, is a team I want to hit on. It's pretty clear what they need. They need to be more athletic. Because the one thing I noticed late in that Duquesne game, and really any time the Duquesne game, if Duquesne wanted to get to the rim, they could. If they wanted to get to the rack and get a foul or go to the basket or whatever, they actually could. Just because, and they were hunting a haul there a little bit at the end. They, if they could stay in front of people, they did, but they couldn't provide tough defense at the rim. They just need to be a bit more athletic. And look, I know they have to play a certain style because of the guys they have, and it is a fun offensive style to watch. And here's the thing, even with a bad shooting night, they were still in that thing to the bitter end. But to me, it's actually pretty, and this is a good, this is good news, bad news. The good news is you know what you need. The bad news is you have restrictions. You might not be able to get it. So Good news, bad news, BYU fans. Do you feel the same about the Cougs? Yeah, definitely. And we like I love Ali Khalifa very much. I think he's one of the most fun players to watch. He had an awful game. Zero. Yeah, does the word rim protect does the term rim protection come to your mind when you think about Ali Khalifa? Because it doesn't for me. I don't know if the word running comes in, <laughs> in the mind for it. Like he just doesn't like he literally goes three point line, three point line, three point line, set a couple picks, set a couple picks, grab the ball. All right, backdoor cut pass. That's all he does. And it's like beautiful to watch because he's good at it. But when it comes to rim protecting, no, that doesn't happen. And if you're a team that has, let's say, four shooters at all times, I agree with you. They need like an athletic big or a someone who can cut and someone who is more athletic, who if you have all this floor spacing and if you have a player like I think of like a player that would be so perfect for them and it's impossible because one, he's not playing college basketball and two, he's in the NBA. But if you could have Adoki Azabuki on that team, that would be incredible. If you could have someone who could rebound, get like be athletic, set great screens. Oh, you're gonna you're gonna guard me while I'm shooting a three. All right, I'm gonna throw an alley oop to Doke. Like they need a player who is like this JaVale McGee type who can rebound, who can set screens, and also like be that person who can attack the rim. But more importantly, like BYU did so much this year. And I think that besides Houston coming into the league and being great, and besides Iowa State, you know, being this team right now. I think BYU was the story of the Big 12 season because nobody had them on their radar at all when it came to teams in the Big 12 to make noise or new teams in the league. And for them to come in and, and be like, you know what, we're we're good. We can, we can hang with the best of the league, and we're going to do things our way. We're not going to be like, you know what, we're going to be physical like the rest of the Big 12. No, they played the game their way, and they came in, and they, they, they won in Allen Fieldhouse. They almost won in Hilton. Like, that's a great season from BYU, and I think, like, Obviously, I, I wish they went deeper because I think they're good enough to do that. But this is a team that I think stocks stocks only up. Congrats to you, Mark Pope. All right, Robbie. Uh, we got to get out of here because the next group of gentlemen is coming on the uh, the 365 webs here. Where can folks find you and your work in all of its variety? Yeah, you can follow me on Twitter at the Triano Kid. You can follow my YouTube, subscribe, like, whatever you want. Hi, I'm Robbie. Got some new content coming out soon. And also, if you really love Caleb Williams content, you could go listen to 670 The Score in Chicago because that is all we're talking about. Is that all it is? Just Caleb Williams? Yeah, uh, it's for sure. He's coming. Uh, we do dabble. We're dabbling more college basketball now because Illinois is in the tournament. I'm in Chicago, by the way. Uh, but uh, yeah. And the Bulls uh, Caleb- are bad. Yeah, the Bulls terrible, but it is all Caleb Williams content, and it is lovely because I love Caleb Williams, and I have a video coming out about him soon because I think I think he gets a lot of hate that he doesn't deserve. I'm with you, and we, we well, here's the thing: you and I had early Caleb Williams coverage, right? I mean, we were we were there from the beginning with his, when his dad was being, you know, oh my god, 
at, that, at that play against Kansas where he took the ball for the first down. Oh my God. I forgot about that. Incredible. Uh, I'll never forget that Red River game he came in. People forget about that game. This the Superman basically. The, the, can't believe it. All right, Robbie. Appreciate you, man. You're the man. Talk